Chapter 79 All eyes turned toward the speaker, High Minister Jir Q, and the young prince commanded him to undertake the mission. So he went out of the city and sought to speak with Cao Zhang. Cao Zhang came quickly to the point. Who has the late prince's seal? asked he. Jir Q replied seriously, There is an eldest son to a house and an heir apparent to a state. Such a question from your lordship is unbecoming. Cao Zhang held his peace and the two proceeded into the city to the gates of the palace. There Jia Kui suddenly asked him, You come as a mourner or as a rival claimant? I am come as a mourner. I never had any ulterior motive. That being so, why bring in your soldiers? Whereupon Cao Zhang ordered his escort to retire and entered the city alone. When the Cao brothers met they fell into each other's arms and wept. Then Cao Zhang yielded command of all his army, and he was directed to go back to Yanling and card it. He obediently withdrew. Cao Kai, being now firmly established, changed the name of the period of his rule to the prolonged wealth era, the first year AD 220. He made Jia Zhu grand commander, he was in prime minister, and Wang Lang high minister, and made many promotions. To the late prince, he gave the posthumous title of the King of Great Might, and buried him in jailing. For the superintendence of the building of King Cao's tomb, Cao Pai nominated Yu Jin, but with malevolent intent. For when Yu Jin reached his post, he found the walls of the rooms decorated with chalk sketches depicting the drowning of the seven armies and the capture of himself by Guan Yu. Guan Yu was looking very dignified and severe. Panda was refusing to bow to the victor, while Yu Jin himself was lying in the dust pleading for his life. Cao Pai had chosen this method of putting Yu Jin to open shame because Yu Jin had not preferred death to the dishonor of capture and had sent an artist on purpose to depict the shameful scenes. When Yu Jin saw them, shame and rage alternately took possession of him till he fell ill. Soon after he died, war waged he for many a year, yet fell prey to craven fear. None can know another's heart, drawing tigers with bones start. Soon after the accession, he was in memorialized the Prince of Wai, saying, The Lord of Yanling has cut himself loose from his army and gone quietly to his post. But your other two brothers did not attend the funeral of their father. Their conduct should be inquired into and punished. Cao Pai took up the suggestion and sent commissioners to each. They who were sent to the younger quickly returned to report Cao Chen, the Lord of Zio Huai, had hanged himself rather than suffer for his fault. Cao Pai ordered honorable burial for Cao Qing and gave him the posthumous title of Prince of Zio Huai. Soon after, the envoy to Lindsay returned to report, the Lord of Lindsay Cao Zhai is spending his time in dissipation, his especial boon companions being two brothers named Ding Yi and Ding Yin. They were very rude. When we presented ourselves, Cao Zhai sat bolt upright, but would not say a word. Ding Yi used insulting words, saying Kin Kao intended our lord to succeed, but was turned therefrom by the slanderous tongues of certain among you. As soon as he is dead, your master begins to think of punishment for his own flesh and blood. The other brother Ding Yin said, In intellect our lord leads the age, and he ought to have been heir to his father. Now, not only does he not succeed, but he is treated in this harsh way by a lot of courtiers of your sort ignorant of what genius means. And then Cao Zhai, in a fit of anger, had ordered his lictors to beat the chief envoy and turn him out. This treatment of his messenger annoyed Cao Pai greatly, and he dispatched a force of three thousand imperial tiger guards under Zhu Chu to arrest his brother and all his immediate surroundings. When Zhu Chu arrived Lindsay, the gate commander stopped him. Zhu Chu slew the general and entered the city and challenged. He went to the residence and found Cao Zhai, and all his companions dead drunk. So he bound them, put them into courts, and sent them to court in Yedron. He also arrested all the officers of the palace. Cao Pai's first order was to put to death Ding Yi and Ding Yin. The two brothers were not wholly base, they had a reputation for learning, and many were sorry for them. Cao Pai's mother, Lady Bayan, was alarmed at the severity of the new rule, and the suicide of her youngest son wounded her deeply. When she heard that Cao Zhai had been arrested and his comrades put to death, she left her palace and went to see her eldest son. As soon as he saw her, the prince hastened to meet her. She began to weep. 
Your brother has always had the weakness for wine, but we let him go his way out of consideration for his undoubted ability. I hope you will not forget he is your brother, and that I bore you both. Spare his life, that I may close my eyes in peace when I set out for the deep springs. I also admire his ability, mother, and have no intention to hurt him. But I would reform him. Have no anxiety as to his fate, said Kaupai. So the mother was comforted and withdrew. The prince then went to a private room and bade them call his brother. Said Huazin, surely the princess mother has just been interceding for your brother, is it not so? It is so, replied the prince. Then let me say that Kaujai is too clever to be content to remain in a humble station. If you do not remove him, he will do you harm. I must obey my mother's command. People say your brother simply talks in literature. I do not believe it myself, but he might be put to the test. If he bears a false reputation, you can slay him. If what they say is true, then degrade him, lest the scholars of the land should babble. Soon Kao Zhai came, and in a state of great trepidation bowed low before his elder brother, confessing his fault. The prince addressed him, saying, Though we are brothers, yet the proper relation between us of prince and minister must not be overlooked. Why then did you behave indecorously? While the late prince lived, you made a boast of your literary powers, but I am disposed to think you may have made use of another's pen. Now I require you to compose a poem within the time taken to walk seven paces, and I will spare your life if you succeed. If you fail, then I shall punish you with rigor. Will you suggest a theme? asked Kao Shai. Now there was hanging in the hall a black and white sketch of two bulls that had been fighting at the foot of a wall, and one of them had just fallen dead into a well. Kao Pai pointed to the sketch and said, Take that as the subject. But you are forbidden to use the words two bulls, one bull fighting wall's foot falling, well and dead. Kao Zhai took seven paces and then recited this poem. Two butchers' victims lowing walked along. Each head bore curving bones, a sturdy pair. They met just by a hillock, both were strong. Each would avoid a pit newly dug there. They fought unequal battle for at length. One laid below a gory mass inert. It was not that they were unequal strength. The wrathful both, one did not strength exert. This exhibition of skill amazed the prince and the whole court. Kao Pai thought he would use another test, so he bade his brother improvise, on the theme of their fraternal relationship, the words brotherhood or brother being barred. Without seeming to reflect, Kao Zhai rattled off this rhyme. They were boiling beans on a beanstalk fire. Came a plaintive voice from the part. Oh, why, since we sprang from the selfsame root? Should you kill me with anger hot? The allusion in these verses to the cruel treatment of one member of a family by another was not lost upon Kao Pai, and he dropped a few silent tears. The mother of both men came out at this moment from her abiding place and said, Should the elder brother thus oppress the younger? The prince jumped from his seat, saying, My mother, the laws of the state cannot be nullified. Kao Zhai was degraded to the rank of Lord Bang Shen. He accepted the decision without a murmur, and at once left his brother's court by horse. Kao Pai's accession was the signal for a set of new laws and new commands. His behavior toward Emperor Zion was more intemperate than his father's had ever been. The stories of his harshness reached Chengdu and almost frightened Liu Bei, who summoned his counselors to discuss what he should do. Said he, since the death of Kao Kao and the accession of his son, the position of the emperor has changed for the worse. Sun Con acknowledges the lordship of Wai, and its influence is becoming too great. I am disposed to destroy Sun Con in revenge for the death of my brother. That done, I will proceed to the capital district and purge the whole land of rebellion. What think you? Then Lyo Hua stood out from the ranks of officers and threw himself upon the earth, saying with tears, Liu Feng and Meng Dao were the true cause of the death of your brother and his adopted son. Both these renegades deserve death. Liu Bei was of the same opinion, and was going to send and arrest them forthwith, but here Zhu Jiang intervened and gave wiser advice. That is not the way. Go slowly or you may stir up strife. Promote these two and separate them. After that you may arrest. The prince of Hanjong saw the prudence of this procedure and stayed his hand. He raised Liu Feng to the governorship of Mai and Zhu, 
and so separated the two delinquents. Now Peng Yong and Meng Dao were old friends. Hearing what was afoot, the former hastened home and wrote warning his friend. The letter was confided to a trusty messenger to bear to Meng Da. The messenger was caught as he went out of the city and carried before Ma Keo, who thus cut wind of the business. He then went to Peng Yang's house where, nothing being suspected, he was received kindly and wine was brought in. The two drank for some time. When Ma Keo thought his house sufficiently of his guard, he said the Prince of Hanjun used to look on you with great favor. Why does he do so no longer? The host began to rave against his master, the obstinate old leather belly. But I will find some way to pay him out. In order to see to what lengths he would go, Marqueo led him on saying truth to tell, I have long hated the man too. Then you join Mengda and attack, while I will win over the people of East and West River lands. That will make it easy enough, said Peng Yong. What you propose is very feasible, but we will talk it over again tomorrow said Marqueo and took leave. Taking with him the captured man and the letter he carried, Marqueo then proceeded to see the prince to whom he related the whole story. Liu Bei was very angry and at once had the intended traitor arrested and put in prison where he was examined under torture to get at full details. While Peng Yang lay in prison, bitterly but vainly repentant, Liu Bei consulted his adviser. That fellow Peng Yong meant to turn traitor. What shall I do with him? The fellow is something of a scholar, but irresponsible, replied Zhu Liang. He is too dangerous to be left alive. Thereupon orders were given that he should be allowed to commit suicide in jail. The news that Peng Yong had been made away frightened his sympathizer and friend Meng Da, and put him in a quandary. Further Liu Feng's promotion and transfer to Mind Yu arrived, and it frightened him still more. So he sought advice from two friends and commanders, the brother Shen Dan and Shen Yi, who lived in Shenyong. My friend Peng Yong, and I did much for the Prince of Hanzhong. But now Peng Yong is dead, and I am forgotten. More than that, the Prince wishes to put me to death. What can I do? said Meng Da. Shen Dan replied, I think I can find a plan that will secure your safety. What is it? asked Meng Da, feeling happier. Desertion. My brother Shen Yi and I have long desired to go over to Wai. You just write the Prince of Hanjun a memorial resigning your service and betake yourself to the Prince of Wai, who will certainly employ you in some honorable way. Then we too will follow. Meng Da saw that this was his best course, so he wrote a memorandum which he gave to the messenger who had brought the recent dispatches to take back with him. That night Meng Da left his post and went to Wai. The messenger returned to Chengdu handed in Meng Da's memorial, and told the story of his desertion. The prince was angry. He tore open the letter and read, In the humble opinion of thy servant, O prince, you have set out to accomplish a task comparable with that of Yi Yin, and to walk in the meritorious footsteps of Liu Wang in building the fame of Dukes Wen and Huan. When the great design was rough hewn, you had the support of the lands of the states of Wu and Chu, wherefore many people of ability incontinently joined you. Since I entered your service, I have committed many faults, and if I recognize them, how much more do you see them? Now, O oh prince, you are surrounded by famous people, while I, useless as a helper at home, and inept as a leader abroad, should be shamed were I to take a place among them. It is well known that when Fan Lai saw certain eventualities, he went sailing on the lakes, and Zai Fan acknowledged his faults and stayed by the rivers. Inasmuch as one cannot take means of safeguarding oneself at the critical and dangerous moment, I desire as is my duty to go away, as I came and tainted. Moreover, I am stupid, and without use or merit, merely born in these days as the sport of circumstances. In the days of old, Chen Sheng, though perfectly filial, incurred the suspicions of his father, and died Wu Zixu, though perfectly loyal, was put to death. Meng Chan, though he extended the borders of Qin, suffered the extreme penalty, and Yu Yi, though he destroyed the might of Kai, was the victim of calumny. Whenever I have read of these men, I have been moved to tears, and now I am in like case and the more mortified. Later Jinju was overwhelmed, and I, an officer of rank, failed in my duty, not one in a hundred behaving as I should. Only I return fangling in Shanyang and seek service abroad. 
Now I desire you, O Prince, graciously to understand, to sympathize with thy servant, and to condone the step he is about to take. Really I am but a mean man, incapable of great deeds. I know what I am doing, and I dare to say it is no small fault. They say that dissolution of bonds should not occasion recrimination, and the dismissed servant should take leave without heart burning. I have taken your orders many times, and now, O oh Prince, you must act yourself. I write this with extreme trepidation, but the reading gave rise to great anger in the breast of the Prince. The unmerited fellow, said he, he turns traitor and dares to insult me by sending a letter farewell. Liu Bei was just giving orders to send a force to seize the deserter when Zhu Jiang interposed, saying, You had better send Liu Feng to capture him and let the two tigers worry each other to weakness. Whether Liu Feng succeeds or fails, he will have to come to the capital, and you can kill him. Thus will you cut off two evils. Liu Bei took his advice. Orders were sent to mind you, and Liu Feng obediently led out his troops. Now Meng Da arrived when Cao Pai was holding the great council. When the attendants told him that General Meng Da Xu had come, Cao Pai summoned him to enter. Said Cao Pai to him, Is this a sincere surrender? Meng Da replied, I was in fear of death for not having relieved Guan Yu. That is my only reason for coming. However, Cao Pai did not trust him. Then they reported that Liu Feng was coming to arrest him with a large army and had attacked Lai Yong and was challenging Meng Da to battle. Cao Pai said you seem to be true. Go then to Zion Yong and take Liu Feng. If you bring me his head, I shall no longer doubt. Meng Da replied, I will convince him by argument. No soldiers will be needed. I will bring him to surrender too. So Meng Da was made general who establishes strong arms lord of Pingyang and governor of Xincheng and sent to guard Zhaingyang and Fancheng. Now there were two generals there already, Zai Hushang and Zhu Huang, who engaged in reducing the surrounding territories. Meng Da arrived, met his two colleagues, and was told that Liu Feng was fifteen miles from the city, whereupon Meng Da wrote him a letter urging him to surrender. But Liu Feng was in no mood to surrender. Instead he tore up the letter and put the messenger to death. The renegade has already made me offend against my duty to my uncle, and now would sever me from my father so that I shall be reproached as disloyal and unfilial, said Liu Feng. Meng Da went out with his army to give battle. Liu Feng rode to the front pointed with his sword at his opponent and railed against him. Death is very near you, replied Meng Da. Yet you continue obstinately in the way of foolishness and will not understand. Liu Feng rode out flourishing his sword. He engaged Meng Da, who ran away before the conflict had well begun. Liu Feng pursued hotly to seven miles. Then he fell into an ambush and found himself attacked on two sides by Zai Hushang and Zhu Huang, also Meng Da returned to the attack. Liu Feng was forced to fly. He made straight for Shangyang pursued all the way. When he reached the city and hailed the gate, he was met by a volley of arrows. I have surrendered to Wai, cried Shen Dan from the city tower. Liu Feng got furious and prepared to attack the wall, but the army of Wai was close behind, and having no resting place, he set off for Fangling. He arrived there to find the banners of Wai set out along the walls. Then he saw Shen Yu wave a signal from the tower, and at once there appeared from the shelter of the wall a body of soldiers, and the leading banner displayed general of the right army Zhu Wang. Liu Feng was worsted by the ambush. Then he made for home. But he was pursued, and only a hundred riders of his remained to him when he regained Chengdu. Seeking an interview with his father, he found but scant sympathy. In response to his petition, made prostrate, and weeping Liu Bei said, Shameful son, how are you come to see me at all? My uncle's mishap was not due to my refusal of help, but because Meng Da thwarted me. You eat as a man, you dress as a man, but you have no more the instincts of a man than an image of clay or wood. What mean you by saying another wretch thwarted you? Liu Bei bade the executioners expel Liu Feng and put him to death. But the prince felt some compunction later when he heard of Liu Feng's treatment to the messenger who had brought Meng Da's letter inviting him to become a traitor. 
and he gave way to grief for the death of Guan Yu until he fell ill. So no military movements were made. After he had succeeded to the princedom, Cao Pai raised all his officers to high rank and had an army prepared of 300,000 and maneuvered them over the southern territories and made great feasts in the county of Kaio in the old state of Pei, which was the land of his ancestors. As the grand army passed by, the aged villagers lined the roads offering gifts of wine, just as when the founder of the Huns returned home to Pei. When it was announced that the regent Marshal Zai Hu Dun was near death, Cao Pai hastened back to Yejun, but arrived too late to see him. He put on mourning for the great leader and instituted magnificent funeral ceremonies. In the eighth month of that same year, AD 220, it was reported that a phoenix had been seen to bow at Shi, and a Jilin had appeared at Lindsay, while a yellow dragon was observed in Yejun. Whereupon Imperial Commander Like and Minister Zhu Zhai discussed these appearances, and putting them all together they concluded, saying, Those splendid signs presage that Wai is about to supplant Han, and the altar of abdication should be set up. Presently a deputation of forty high officers, both military and civil, led by Hua Zin Wang Lang, Zin Pai Jia Zhu Liu Yi Liu Zai Chen Jai O Chen Kun, and Hu and Jai went into the Forbidden City, and proposed to Emperor Zion that he should abdicate and yield to the Prince of Wai Kao Pai. It is time to set up the throne of Wai, and steal the land from the hands. The next chapter will record the Emperor's reply.